Yeah, I guess we can start. So, good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming. I'm Martin Pitt. And yeah, the motto of our conference bears the question, how do people actually build a spaceship? Like, if that was your average open source project from like five years ago, it would probably go like, hey, take this spare metal pipe, fill it up with uh, fuel, stick a pilot on top, light it up, cross your fingers, and then let the bug reports come in, right? But for some reason, someone told these engineers that this wasn't acceptable. So spaceships are built by carefully designing each and every component and then carefully testing every change to it with every conceivable corner case. And quite fortunately, in the open source world, we are now slowly moving towards that attitude as well, because we finally realize, hey, writing all these tests and running them in CI is not a burden, but it actually makes our life easier and kept, keeps our sanity and productivity. But um, uh, in the special case of the Linux plumbing layer, uh, how do you actually write tests for things like UDisk or UPower, Network Manager, Modem Manager, LibMTP, or LibInput? These things talk to a lot of devices, which you usually don't have in your test VMs, and maybe not even the developer has them. And that's what I want to show you today, give you some tools and tricks how to approach that problem. <clears throat> So, of course, I can't dive into the details, but the idea is to give you some initial taste and some ideas what's possible, and then you can RTFM later on when you need it. Oh, of course, this thing sleeps. The first thing I want to cover is disks. Now, of course, we all know block dev uh, loop devices, and they are fine for the simple cases, but they really don't feel and smell like proper hard disks. Like they have lots of special cases, special names. You already run into trouble when you try partitioning them. You need special tools like KPartX. And like you can't do fault injection, you can't do different device types. They don't scale very well. So a much more powerful tool is the kernel module called SCSI Debug. This is an actual in-kernel SCSI driver, which uh, is backed by a RAM disk. So we can just load that module, like for example with a size of 100 megabyte. The default is 8 megabytes, so it may be a little small. And then we see in the kernel, like it detected something like an SDB, which is already quite familiar. And in GNOME disk, we can see it appears here as a normal disk. We can even put a partition table on it. Is that really my... yes. <laughs> Don't want to format my internal hard disk. <laughs> I did that once and yeah, not pretty. We could also put a partition on it and we could mount it. Yada yada. <laughs> and we see, okay, it's mounted. So far, so good. Now, the first cool thing that you can do is to simulate that a user just rips out the device. Like, for example, if you have a USB stick or a CD-ROM drive, or you just eject while it's still being mounted. So let's do that. And we, the kernel complains a little bit about like uh, something went wrong with this device. But here we, for example, see that new disks did its duty and cleaned up the mount point. And this has broken like repeatedly in the past, so now it really shouldn't anymore because this is running in CI. <coughs> uh, no, not this. So another cool thing is how to, like, let's add like 100 devices at once. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, at hosts equals 100. And uh, I'm screwing this up, sorry. So. <sighs> Learn to type, it's at host. <laughs> okay. And now we have like a gazillion devices here. We see it here. And this was actually very useful in testing and fixing some bottlenecks in new disks. Like there is server environments which have like gazillions of disks attached and new disks previously just took ages to process them all. And yeah, try that with loop devices. <laughs> right. 
Or what about adding a CD-ROM instead? Now we get an SL0, again, very familiar. And also UDISC agrees, it's a CD-ROM drive. Pretty nice. Or what about fault injection? So the SCSI module has this magic opts, or what is it? Opts, yeah. Um, bit field where we can tweak like various things, and one of those is that you simulate a medium error at the sector hexadecimal one, two, three, four. And if we try to write something on it, so write device. <laughs> Then we see it stops at like the decimal equivalent of that number, and we see the kernel reports we've got a medium error. And again, this is probably not something which you want to force on your real hard disks when you test the behavior of your plumbing stack. So this is used in real life in the UDISCs integration test, so you can look at how it's being used there. And it's documented in the, like in the normal kernel documentation directory. OK, so much for block devices. Let's move to a different class, uh, network. Uh, the simpler case is, of course, uh, Ethernet. So a very useful for testing network. Uh, Ethernet is the VE kernel, uh, the, the, the virtual kernel driver. So for those who don't know, uh, you can create this out of thin air, and it gives you a symmetric pair of connected devices. And what you do is you consider one of these uh, as like the local end, which you want to put under test with, for example, Network Manager, and the other is the remote end, which you set up with a known good tool like uh, DNS mask, for example. <coughs> so uh, the commands are a little too uh, laborious to type, so I put them into a shell script. Let's quickly go through. Uh, the first thing is just some bureaucracy, so Network Manager uh, ignores VE devices by default for good reasons. So we need to tell it to unignore our local end so that it manages that, but not the remote end, of course. So this is the interesting bit. Uh, that basically tells the kernel to create this VE device pair. And we use each 42 as the local end and remote 42 as the router. And then we just need to give our router an IP and start DNS mask on it so that we can do DHCP and prove that like, you can actually talk to these devices. You see here, or well, maybe it's a little small, that I'm not connected to anything right now. But let's run this and see what happens. And we see we Network Manager is spinning a little bit, and we see that it's picked up some DHCP. We also see it on the server. We can ask connection information, and we are at a wired connection. And when we stop it, everything goes away, and we are once again disconnected. But uh, now let's, uh, let's let it up a notch. And we want to simulate a Wi-Fi, because that's also a very common case. By the way, let's filter out some lock, lock noise here. Otherwise, it's a little too annoying. So Wi-Fi is, of course, a little more complicated because like, there is a whole new concept around that. Uh, but there is another useful kernel module. It's called Mac 802.11.hw sim. Try to pronounce that 10 times. Uh, so how do we use that? In the beginning, that looks very similar, but now we need to do the opposite. Of course, Network Manager manages Wi-Fi devices by default, so now we need to tell it to not manage our remote end. But otherwise, it's pretty similar. So if we load that module, we once again get a symmetric connected pair of two devices, WLAN 0 and 1, and we do the remote local thing again. So we set up our router, give it an IP. And this is the new bit here. So on our remote end, we need to set up like a, a Wi-Fi router stack. And the standard tool on Linux for that is host APD. So this is by no means like a test-only thing. This is an actual thing which you often find in Linux-based hardware routers. So for here, we give it in hardware mode, like H0211G, which is like 
middle ages, and we can give it an SSID and this super secret passphrase. And this bit, once again, is familiar. We just put the HTTP server on top of it so that we can prove that communication works. So let's run that. So Network Manager does some yada yada. Did we pick up something? Yes, we did. We have a the Wi-Fi. So let's connect to that. Yeah, I didn't mistype it. <laughs> and so it's spinning around a little bit here. Come on, second green dot. And we are connected. So once again, connection information, we picked up a DHCP address. So communication works with our fake rotor. And yeah, we clean it up and everything goes away. So both of these, VEs and Wi-Fi, are in active use in the Debian and Ubuntu auto package tests for Network Manager and also NetPlan. And the VEF part is also being used to test Network D in its upstream tests. And yeah, once again, communication is in the IP, uh, documentation is in the IP link man page for VEF and in the kernel documentation for the module. <clears throat> okay, so block and network devices are really rather special beasts in the Linux world because they are very, have very complex behavior or are not even like in the standard device format that most devices are. But most Linux devices and drivers are much, much simpler. So usually you have a character device in slash dev, uh, which you read from or write to, or sometimes send a few ioctals to. And for these more generic devices, a couple of years ago, I wrote a, a tool called uh, umock dev. And this is able to essentially mock your whole slash sys tree and slash dev and slash proc and redirects them to a temporary directory. And it does that with a preload library so that the whole thing needs no privileges at all. You can simulate devices and hardware with unit tests with make check and you need no root privileges or any kind of special kernel. It can also emulate U events by doing the same redirection trick on the Netlink socket. So you can also like, uh, satisfy UDEF, for example. At its heart, it's a C library. It also has GI bindings, so you can use it from Python, from JavaScript, or your favorite programming languages. Uh, but there's also CI tools, which are very nice to interactively try uh, play around with it. So we don't need the root shell, so back to normal user. By default, if you run a project a program under this wrapper, you get a completely uh, empty slash usfs tree. Uh, da -da -da -da. So nothing in it. And of course, that's not very useful. So let's load something into it. The most convenient interactive form is to uh, put those into text files. Just, just pretend we have a, a foo device. If you look into those, these look very similar to what uh, udev admin info export db gives you. Maybe some of you are familiar with this. So you have the device path and the device name, and the e colons are the udev properties, like the standard dev name and subsystem, for example. But in addition, if this also says, yeah fixing. This, in addition, this also saves um, the Sisyphus attributes. So a standard one is the device major and minor, and like a non-standard one is this mode thing, which I just invented. So let's load this into our sandbox. Let's just run bash so that we can mess around a little bit. If you now look at sys, we see that it, uh, maybe we close this, so a little more space we see that it creates a pretty standard Sisyphus layout for us. So we have our foo device here. Uh, foo, we have our magic mode uh, attribute. And it also does all the standard uh, by class and bus symlinks for you. And we also have this foo device in slash dev. And you see, it looks pretty much like a standard Thing, what you would uh, what you expect it's a character device with the correct major and minor of course what it really is in reality
is that it's just a simple PTS, which is reasonably close to a character device, so uh, that, that the preload library doesn't have too much work to do in uh, shaping it into the, the expected form. Okay, so ex uh, this already gives you the appearance of the device, so not yet the behavior. But this is already pretty useful. For example, UPower does that to simulate various kinds of empty or full batteries, UPSs, or combinations thereof. You can also simulate input devices, like lid switches or touch screens, and none of those are usually available in, in a VM. Of course, the latter can also be done by uh, FEMU, but that again needs root privileges and kernel support. <clears throat> but uh, again, let's go further. We not only want to emulate the appearance of a device in SysFS, but we also want to emulate and record the behavior of it. So for devices which are merely writ uh, read from and written to, uh, UMOCDEV can basically record the entire conversation with that device node, including correct timing information, and put that into a file. And then in your test suite, you can load that back, and basically UMOCDEV will simulate the remote end and replay the whole thing. So this has been pretty useful to write tests for, for example, modem manager. You can take a real 3G stick, plug it in, uh, record the conversation, and then put that either into a back report or your test suite, so that the developer who does not have this device can uh, reproduce the problem or like your test, make sure that it doesn't break. It also can record and replay ioctals from FDEF devices, so you can simulate actual clicks and movements on Wacom devices, for example. And the third thing that it can currently do is uh, USB regressed blocks. So this is the thing that you get with MTP, like communication with your phone, or Gphoto with your camera, and various other things. And I want to demonstrate that. So here I have my phone connected in MTP mode, I hope. Uh, yeah, here it is, 3.3. Uh, three. Three. And I first want to record all the SysFS properties and the UDEV properties from it. Uh, uh, no. Dev bus USB, what was it? 3.3. Three. Three. So, if we look at this, we, uh, we see it's pretty similar to the food.umogdev example that I've shown earlier, except, of course, there's a whole bunch of more properties and attributes and everything that SysFS gives you. And it also contains all the parent devices of that thing, so that your SysFS tree is complete. And now we can also record the, the behavior from uh, talking to the device. For example, uh, da -da -da -da. We sent this to temp Sony by Octal. And let's just run something simple like MTT, MTT, MPT detect. All right. Uh, if you poke inside, you see this is a, basically a giant tree of all the ioctals that happen on the device. And it's a tree so that uh, you cannot, re when you replay this, you aren't bound to the exact same order as the record, but you can actually repeat steps or do steps in, the, in a different order and something. And you can also add stuff for different LibUSB devices, uh, LibUSB versions where the form and shape of the octals might change, which happens uh, fairly often, unfortunately. But, so this .ioctl and the .umogdev files, these would be the two artifacts which you stick into a test read or put into a bug report, for example. So, magic. I disconnect that thing. <laughs> so now let's see what happens if we use these records. Let's first just run the, uh, the static thing. This is already, uh, yes. Typing. So if you look at this, uh, we see that our testbed contains my Sony and the, the parent hub. But of course, if we try to run MPT detect this, uh, MP, MTP detect on this, it will just freak out because like, it, there appears to be a device, 
but since there's no record of anything, it will just try to start to talk to the device and then say, whoa, there's nobody answering. But of course, we can also load our recorded ioxyl trace. Uh, so. And here we see like it's doing stuff. <coughs> so as a little disclaimer, you see at the end, there seems to be a bug there. <laughs> and indeed, this broke like sometimes in the, in the past year. So uh, before that, this was working pretty much perfectly. You could record a conversation in Shotwell and import a couple of, um, a couple of pictures, and then we play everything of that. But apparently something in libUSB or libMTP uh, made the ioctal structure a little more flexible, and umocdev cannot currently do this. So put the blame on myself, I need to check that down. But everything else, like FDEF, ioctals works perfectly, and everything else too. <clears throat> right, so that's basically my demo. I think we have a couple of minutes left for questions. Staff. Oh, can also repeat, but. Uh. Do you have a library of common devices or uh, IOCTL traces that people seem to use across the Debian project, not just one place that are reusable? I have a couple of examples in the upstream project. Uh, but there is no such thing like an official GitHub place where people can collect those. So usually, like I, I use this to, to write integration tests for like Debian's uh, Shotwell package, for example, and I just stick the, the traces in there. Uh, so I'm not sure how useful that be, would be because like it's really nice for bug reports, but as I said, this ages relatively quickly. Like as soon as your libUSB version changes and it changes the format of these ioctals, of course this can only do so much magic. If like the uh, like the real device sends uh, a block which is not in the trace, then the whole thing will just uh, go up in flames. And, but yeah, no, there isn't. I just kept a, keep a couple of examples here. Any other question, please? <laughs> Is there a place where you record a version of libUSB and stuff like that, so you can at least detect why it goes in flames? Uh, I currently don't, because uh, like uh, the 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 recording place doesn't actually know that. I mean, you 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 basically provide this preload library, which intercepts things like read, write, or octal, but uh, I mark, you you mark the record doesn't know what's running inside. Of course, you can add some metadata to the files. Uh, and I think that's possible. Like we do have one instance of that. We record the device name, which we recorded. It doesn't need to be the same on replay, but sometimes it's useful to know that. So I'm very happy to add that. I mean, it's trivial to do. It's just a simple text file. Uh, but yeah, maybe that would be useful indeed. Right now, you usually see this kind of stuff in the Git log when you see update the Oracle traces to libUSB version one two three. <coughs> Okay, anything else? Uh, uh. So a bunch of folks that I work with uh, get kind of crazy with uh, building various Gen 2 builds for their laptop. Would, could you foresee any value in setting up a trace like uh, from the very beginning of the boot of an individual's machine to record all of the kind of USB devices so that before they attempted to reboot into a uh, new kernel or something, they could verify that, uh, or basically set up a test rig for their own machine to verify that everything would come up correctly. Um, well, I'm not sure about the continuous aspect of that, but what you can currently do is tell Umoctiv Record to just say, dump my entire system, and you will get like a, I don't know, a 100 kilobyte file, and this has each and every device in it. And then if you, okay, if you reboot, you can do the same thing and basically compare the thing. It's similar to what you would do with UDF admin info export DB, but as I said, this is lacking the Sisyphus attributes. You can also get them from UDF admin, of course, but with that, you have everything in one file, and maybe it's easier to diff or something. So that works, yeah. And in fact, I, I've used it for something like that. So I think we have time for one more quick question, and then it's 
over to Steph, who will tell you where to actually run all these tests in a sensible manner. <laughs> Not okay. Otherwise, grab me in the hallway. And just one note, uh, the, the talks page uh, has a link. Uh, where I put all my notes and the demo scripts and pointers to documentation for like the SCSI debug and everything else I talked about. So yeah, thanks for your attention and please go write tests. <laughs> 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 so.